Welcome to Vermont Artists and Authors, where we interview great storytellers and artists from the amazing Green Mountain State. This is episode 21. I'm your host, Barney Smith of StoryComic.com, and we're excited to have with us the internationally acclaimed and award-winning performance artist, puppeteer, and pop culture icon, Paul Zaloom. Paul. Uh, hi. How are you that, doing? That, that was a very yeah. that was an impressive uh, introduction. I, I hope to live up to it. <laughs> So it's interesting, you know, I, I reached out to you. You have Vermont roots. You went to uh, Goddard School. You're also an alumni of Bread and Puppet Theater. And uh, and, and, and farmer wilderness camps in um, Plymouth Union and and that area of, uh, it's not central Vermont. It's no, it's like we're in the Northeast Canyon, the Quaker camp, right? Is yeah, it's one? northern, southern Vermont. <laughs> like the main camps are just south, south of Woodstock. Right. Uh, but I went to Salt Ash Mountain, which is um, uh, on Lake Nineveh, which I believe is in Plymouth Union. Right. Right. And yeah, Quaker, great Quaker camp. They were integrated from day one in 1947 when they were founded. Right. And a really wonderful place. And I was an exchange student at Putney School in Putney, Vermont, as a high school senior. Um. So, yeah, I go back a little bit and then Goddard College, um, the great hippie college in Plainfield, Vermont, which is now a low residency uh, institution and doing real well. And that's where you initially kind of got into it when you're at Goddard. It was they had the also the, the Bread and Puppet Theater. That's when you kind of first got your so kind of started sinking your teeth into puppetry. From there, correct? Yeah, Bread and Pub was in residence at Goddard um, on a farm that was part of the campus just down the road from uh, Northwood, um, yeah. Kate Farm, which is now a, it's back to being a working farm. Yeah. And so the theater was in residence there, later moved to Glover in the Northeast Kingdom to another uh, farm, even more spectacular. And uh, yeah, so I took a couple of workshops and ended up joining the company and writing my senior thesis about Bread and Puppet. And I'm on the board and it's been 50. I'm on the advisory board because I live far away and it's better for me to advise. And um, But it's pretty much the same as a voting board member. It's interesting as you know, you bring that up because, you know, it's just the the idea of the arts and the the idea of and you mentioned in a previous interview you, you talked about that that puppetry is coming back. Do you do you still stand on that? Being six years later, do you still see that that there is something about the analog version of art? This push that 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 puppetry is still stronger than it was, say, like twenty years ago. I think, yeah, I think that's probably true. Um, there's a couple of universities that have puppetry programs, particularly uh, University of Connecticut, which also has a fabulous puppet museum, the Ballard Museum, uh, run by the great puppet scholar, John Bell, who has been a colleague of mine, bread and puppet for a million years, oh, wow. an amazing performer. And CalArts had a puppet program for a while, and, uh, you know, people teaching classes and stuff like that. There's the Eugene O'Neill Center that does a puppet thing every uh, year for a week or two. So there's a lot more, like, educational slash institutional training and all that kind of stuff. And they just, you know, grind people out, pop people out. You got these puppeteers all over the place. So right. that probably has something to do with it. It's cheap and down and dirty and alternative puppeteers have traditionally gotten away with saying things that actors can't say because the authorities by nature, you know, sort of vert, lean on the stupid side and don't really make the connection between the puppeteer and the puppet, you know, it's sort of mediated. The political opinions are mediated and are not like firsthand. Right. So that's been true for thousands of years that puppeteers have been able to get away with more, than, than actors in terms of saying things. And uh, uh, puppetry has always been political because, right. because of that. And also because puppeteers, you know, played on the street or, you know, they hung out with the pickpockets and the prostitutes or whatever. So we've always been uh, disreputable. And uh, I hope that, 
I hope that reputation stays. <laughs> <It's still there. laughs> I don't hang out with a lot of prostitutes or pickpockets, uh, pick but I am. I'm fascinated by pickpockets. I mean, yeah. <laughs> when you were on, when you talked about when you were on Beekman's World, that you did mention that one of the directors did say that your movements had a beginning, middle, and end, and that was right. part of the fact that you were able to some of that that training of puppetry. What what would be some of the other trainings that you would have to pick up on if you're getting a career in puppetry? I'm not convinced that you need training. Right. Uh, maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't know. I mean, I've taught puppetry. I don't know how valuable that was. You know, some people told me it was, you know, kind of valuable or whatever. I mean, I wasn't trained. I just learned by experience working with the Brother and Puppet. And, um, and we don't have work. I mean, Bread and Puppet does do workshops on the road. Right. Because all artists have to do that. You can't make a living unless you do it. Um, and there's a good there's a good aspect to that. I mean, in, with Bread and Puppet, the workshops have tended to be just getting people to be in shows. Mm -hmm. So you learn by doing. You know, Peter just, he doesn't teach. He lectures, but he he doesn't lecture about puppetry in a way where you could walk away and say, oh, now I understand puppetry. That's not really his tip. He's more ranting about politics and uh, the duties of puppetry and cheap art and the possibilities and things of that nature. Right. Um, I mean, I think you can get something really great out of going to puppet school. My friends who went to UConn, they learned to sew. They learned how to use a sewing machine. Now that's like super helpful. Right. So I never learned. I mean, I do sew. You have to sew if you're a puppeteer. You got to fix right. stuff on the road, you know. Um, and they do. They learn uh, voice also, um, voice stuff, which I think is really important and really good. And sometimes they're exposed to very broad um swath of influences which can be really good i taught at the uh institut international de la marionette which is in charville mezier in france and that's the that's the big international puppet school in france and that was interesting working with them um and basically we just made up shows mm. they you know we worked together with found objects and did some stuff and then they made work and then we did a public performance that's the way i like to teach right have people come with material i help them work it out and at the end of the whole thing we have a cabaret and everyone performs okay because if you think you know like if you if you think about it like what's what's so what's so important about puppetry is basically taking all the arts and putting it together as you say there's crafting, there's painting, there's, 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 there's acting, there's writing, there's, you take every single piece of every type of art and you put it into, into one genre and say, you have to be good at, you have to learn all of it. You know? Right. You don't have to be good at any of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it helps to be, you know, it helps to be good. Right. I mean, there, are, the thing is I had a, um, a friend of mine recently, um, he's a, an artist and he was talking about painting. And uh, I just thought, wow, he's kind of a snob and he's bad mouthing all these painters who I like. And then I thought, well, you know, I, I'm as opinionated about puppetry <laughs> as he is about art. So, and, you know, you do, when you do something for a while, you do begin to have opinions about what the rules are, what you can do, what you can't do. And, right. and then you see an, an amateur, like pick up a puppet and do something that maybe breaks the rules or that you can't do that. Right. You, for some reason, that person is able to, so that's what keeps you humble. That's what makes you realize that all the training and all your dedication, all that can still be trumped by some person just picking up a puppet and doing something that you can't do. And that's wonderful. I love that. That's really <laughs> great. Uh, you know, the whole thing about being an expert. Yeah, there's an aspect of it, but it 
ultimately of thinking of yourself as being an expert is not helpful. It's better to think of yourself as being a novice or somehow stripping away all that experience. And right. we also say in puppetry that the puppet tells you what to do. You don't get to tell it what to do. And it's such a corny cliche. Right. But if you talk to anybody who works with puppets, they'll tell you that's that's the case. Right. You know, you get the thing, you play with it like a kid plays. You play and then you see what it does. Um, I mean, I do ventriloquism. That's one of the types of puppetry I do. And there have been times when the, the dummy, whose name is Butch Manley, he just writes his own material. It makes me laugh. I, you know, I don't know where I don't know where he comes up with this stuff. <laughs> you know, a lot of people tell you that writers and stuff like that. They have like voices in their heads. And right. um, and uh, it's been a challenge figuring that out. I have to say it's uh figuring out what the right material it's very different than puppetry it's it's a kind of puppetry but it's really different than all the rest and what you see in the other part of the image there that's a show called white like me mm -hmm. uh where i use action figures and tchotchkes and um uh, knickknacks and bubble wrap and get a dog a bone blah 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 <laughs> uh to tell a story about uh, white anxiety. And I made that show in 2010. <laughs> it was a little prophetic, uh, just about white anxiety about being uh, marginalized. So a, a phony history of uh, Caucasian uh, wonderfulness. Right. What would you say too was the medium of puppetry is really good at embracing that other genres have more difficulty in doing? The thing is you can play with scale right you can you can pretty much do anything you know if you want to go to mars you can go to mars like i i worked on a film with a the painter sandow burke and um his artistic partner and wife uh elise pinulay and sean meredith the director and they he had done a whole version of dante's inferno right um and uh, set sort of in contemporary times. And he said, oh, let's make a movie. And I was like, I don't want to do a live action movie of Dante's Inferno. Like, who wants to do that? Build all these sets and, they, you know, it's going to cost a mint and it's a pain in the ass. Right. I, I'm not interested. I said, let's do toy theater. Let's do paper theater. And they were like, what? <laughs> and we went to the toy theater museum that used to be in Santa Ana. And uh, I conned them into it. They totally got into it. And it was it's just really fun to use puppets. Right. Uh, you can just, you know, anything you can imagine, you can pretty much do. That's what I like about it. And no special effects or, you know, maybe sometimes a cover and error or something. But Right. When, what do you see as, like, one of your, your go-to – like, if you were – if. Because you just can you kind of mention like the the paper puppets? What's your kind of go to like puppetry that you're just like I'm gonna go straight to this one? Would it be like shadow puppets, rod and arm puppets, marionettes? What would be the one that you would that you kind of default to your default medium? To well, it really depends like what the project is, right. what you want to tackle, what subject matter you're interested in, and then you figure out what medium is the the one that's going to be the most helpful to accomplishing my evil agenda. Mm. Um, you know, I was sitting around one Christmas uh, and looking at some of the Christmas tchotchkes my mother had, the little Santa Clauses from Denmark. And it occurred to me, oh, that's interesting, Santa Claus. Like you could do a close-up of this one, then cut to a two-shot of this one with a snowman, and then do an extreme close-up of the third Santa Claus and everyone would still know it's the same character. So you could, that there's, that's only true of Santa Claus and Jesus and Joseph Stalin and, you know, a couple other people. Um, and I don't have Joseph Stalin um, tchotchkes. They're hard to get. And um, Jesus, I'm not touching that with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, Santa Claus so 300 Santa Clauses later, and we've made a bunch of films. And it's, you know, I started doing found objects in the late 70s just because I thought it was interesting to take garbage and debris and packaging material, toys and stuff you found in the trash and animating that as if it was puppets. And then 
I want to progress beyond that and using action figures and tchotchkes and knickknacks and just all this ugly crap to use that as puppets. And right. I think the, the, the found object thing, that caught on. It's become something called object theater and all that. It's become a thing and whatever. But the tchotchke thing, the, I call it theater of the tchotchke knickknack. You know, that's like, to everyone, that's like cheating. You didn't build them, you know. It's like w even worse than the found object thing. But they're so dumb. And and what's so great is that somebody made these things with an idea and they make these expressions. You know, you manipulate it. It's interesting. And the foundness of it and the sort of stupidity of it is is fascinating to me. Right. So um, anyway, yeah. I make, We've been making little movies. I have a... Um, YouTube channel called Fruit of Zaloom. <laughs> Fruit of Zaloom. And those videos are on there if you need a five minute laugh. That's been my latest uh, undertaking. Okay. How important have you, have you seen as somebody who's been in the arts for a while? Have, have you seen a rise in importance to the arts because of where we've been? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's always been important to me. I'm a big fan of, uh, of fine art, of prints and painting, sculpture. You know, I miss going to the museum, mm -hmm. doing more of that now. Um, I love reading about it, art and design. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where it's placed. I mean, just the simple fact of being in the room with people again is really great. Right. You don't really realize it until, you know, you're in the middle of it, you're around people, you're at some event. You're like, wow, this is really kind of unfamiliar. It's been a while. Um, so, yeah, I hope I hope there's a resurgence and a great a, a certain amount more interest because, uh, you know, we've all been hiding in our basements. Right we all retreated to the arts to keep ourselves connected before this, you know, before COVID, we were, you know, our budgets were being cut in schools. Our, this was being cut. Do you see this as a, as somebody who is a, a leading face of one genre of art, which is puppetry and performance art? Do you see that push happening like a resurgence of investing more money into the arts now because of what we've gone through? I did serve on a panel. That was interesting. Um, that was an <coughs> interesting way to get connected to the local LA art scene. It was for emergency money, COVID money. And I was very inspired by the work being done by these venues all across the city, the dedication of people, of uh, arts administrators who were not always my favorite, <laughs> <laughs> you know, having dealt with people. But the, at the end of the day, there's so many dedicated people who, you know, work for peanuts, work their fingers to the bone, and so dedicated. And, you know, we artists owe them a lot because they're making it possible for us to do our work. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was that was very inspiring and very eye opening. And it was tough because we had to select just a certain number of people to get this, you know, five million bucks or whatever it was. Right. And so have you been able to, because I know pre-COVID that you were doing some workshops. You've been doing some workshops through, through some video platforms? I did, I did some work at, for uh, UConn for their puppetry program. I did a um, like a visiting professor thing via uh, Zoom. And I used to travel a lot in Mexico and Brazil right. because I was uh, on a TV show that was very popular in um, Latin America, and it was really fun to go down there and perform. Uh, the fans are fanatical for some reason in Mexico and Brazil and Venezuela, not in Venezuela, uh, <laughs> in Chile and Argentina and Paraguay. And so that was fun going on tour and going down there and doing live shows based on the show. It was a kid's science show called Beekman's World. Right. And it yeah. was a, uh, basically science education for kids and uh, it really struck a chord with the latin sensibility so i went down there a lot doing live shows and that was fun well because yeah i noticed that you know on your on, on your website you did talk about that your beekman's world ran from 92 to 97 
Well, that's we shot from 92 to 96 or 97, something like that. But they have been in second run syndication and have been on Canal Once in uh, in Mexico and uh, the reruns and stuff like that. I mean, it would be great if it was on Netflix and it was somewhere other than YouTube uh, these days because it is evergreen and it was an educational show. It was, you know, pro-social and all of that. Right. But... I don't think the studio cares much and uh, right. it's, it's kind of sad because I, I think the show is pretty good and I think it was pretty educational, but you know, it, we did the best we could. Sometimes it wasn't so hot. Sometimes it was great, you know, just like anything else. <laughs> it, it, it was, you know, innovative at this time when that was being shot because it was the character Beekman was created by one of your friend and colleague at the time. Um, yeah. Uh, Jock Church. He was yeah, the guy. Who created, he created uh, an, a. Um, it was on the funny pages in the comics, and it was for kids. And he created it on a Mac, and it was syndicated in like three hundred newspapers. And a guy in Hollywood got the idea: let's turn this into a kid show, yeah. uh, to solve the requirements of the Children's Television <laughs> Act for having a certain amount of educational and or informational programming every day for kids if local stations want to get their licenses renewed. So right. it was really a government mandate that uh, created the educational shows that came out of the 90s. Right. And uh, it was very much inspired by Soupy Sales and Lord Buckley and, uh, you know, less so Mr. Wizard, but to some degree. Right. And uh, it was a hell of a lot of fun. We had a great time. We had it's because it, one of the things that you mentioned in a previous interview is that you you don't see that ever coming back because of the the cost of production of those shows is was was too high, and also they're geared towards kids. Where you, I remember you were saying that nowadays they have to gear children's programming towards parents as well. Well, and towards merchandising. Right. I mean, th because the the way they make their money is with toys hmm. and um, and merchandise. So there are kid shows that I mean, the, our show I think costs between two hundred and two hundred fifty thousand bucks an episode. I think kid shows on TV now are more like sixty five thousand bucks in terms of production costs. So to have a live action show is really tough to do on 65,000 bucks with any kind of production values. And we had pretty high production values. I mean, it was a big ass set on a, a sound stage at Sunset Gower Studios, one of the earliest studios in, um, in Hollywood. And it was a beautiful set. It was huge. So all these different locations we could shoot in. Um, and that's kind of what made it fun too, is just the beauty of the set and hanging out there and, we had a great crew and wonderful writers. We just had fun all day, all night long. It was just a total blast. <laughs> a lot of work, though. Uh, Jock Church, he passed away in 2016, correct? I, I think that's right, the date. Yeah. Uh, he had diabetes. He had a heart attack on the set, actually, one wow. day. But um, he had very bad diabetes and... Um, and he did. He died. He was. He was a great guy. He was a real character. Had a really interesting history, and uh, we got along really well. Um, and you know, he he invented this thing, and right. it turned into something that uh, was, I think, beyond his wildest dreams. Right. Because I know for for a while you actually did had a Beekman on the brain. Is that what it? Beekman that was on one the of the stage shows. I I. But because I come from Bread and Puppet, like the only way we know how to make a living is like take it on the road. So that was one of the things I learned from Bread and Puppet is like make a show, figure out how to get it in and out of there quickly, low tech. Right. Um, and I toured almost all the states with a bunch of different shows. I made one about the brain because I really found that interesting. And I put ventriloquism, I put toy theater in it. I did uh, sort of a slideshow. I had video. I had all kinds of different media. And uh, it playing for kids in, in a thousand seat theater is a hell of a lot of fun. I mean, <laughs> getting them all riled up. And, right. you know, I had a lot of, of burping jokes. You know, I had the one vent figure it was a, um, a skull, a talking skull. Mm -hmm. And um, 
you know, he burped a lot. The kids loved that. So it was, it was a lot of fun. I love touring and doing those shows for kids. When I play in Mexico and Brazil, there's like one kid in the audience and 5,000. <laughs> it's a total like nostalgia thing. It's a, you do the show in English, right? Yeah. 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 Um, I learned French in school. I've performed in French, but I did not learn Spanish, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the guy who does the voice for the dubbing, he often accompanies me okay. and does the uh, simultaneous translation. And, you know, a lot of young folks who are the, the fans tend to be college students and also people in their mid 30s and older. They tend to have college educations because you know they were interested in science and they kind of pursued that and they ended up at, as doctors or I'm um, astrophysicists and mm -hmm. you know science teachers and all kinds of folks so a lot of them speak English I just have to kind of go slow right uh with Beekman is that kind of like a a, a loaned out intellectual property or are you was this owned by jock church the character beekman or was this something that you that you shared or how did that work out sony and columbia pictures television says they own the 91 episodes okay and the music so they say everything else is owned by the estate of jock church okay um so i i did the live shows for like 30 years and no one complained so oh, wow. the way the copyright law works is i'm you know i'm allowed to do the live shows because no one complained i did them for a million years <laughs> uh, and jock was super generous and real cool about letting me do that right a question about puppetry because i know specifically as you said earlier you kind of create some puppets and you kind of wait to see what their personality kind of becomes as you're kind of building it. Is there some sort of intellectual property piece on that where another puppeteer cannot create the same puppet? Anything like that? I, I don't know. I've okay. never bothered copywriting anything. It's <laughs> like who would want to copy, you know, <laughs> it would be like a big loser move to like pop something for me, man. I don't suggest it. I would recommend it i mean it's interesting with the hensons that jim invented a kind of puppet these mouth puppets these foam things that has that watermelon wedge kind of mouth and i don't i don't think that that style or that design is copyrighted mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people who do that style and muppet style of puppets and i don't think that the henson company and the kids are all that happy with that they're like that was his thing that's what he did why do it and i kind of agree with that right um there are also you know theaters that have done bread and puppet style stuff where their sculptural and painting style is not that different i my thing when i left bread and puppet was i want to do something as completely diametrically opposed as possible because you can't compete with the guy. It's like the greatest puppeteer of the 20th century. His work is like unbelievable. Right. I, I couldn't possibly, you know, <laughs> compete with that. So I did the found objects and I did, you know, I made a, um, a gay Punch and Judy show, Punch and Jimmy. Right. Um, uh, you know, and headed in a lot of, did shadow puppets and ventriloquism. You know, Schumann, when he saw my ventriloquist act, he said, well, you're very good at that, but I hate that thing. You know, he, he <laughs> hates it. So that's cool. You know, I don't care. It's like, it's not his thing. He hates it. It's diametrically opposed to what he believes puppet, puppetry should be and should do. And right. I understand that. And I agree with him, but it's, he's not an American. He's, you know, he was raised in Germany and ventriloquism is a particular thing. And plus it resonates with us because of our memories of it in television, whether it be, um, you know, Ed, Ed, Edgar Bergen with Charlie McCarthy or, or senior Wences or um, so it's a different cultural resonance that's going on there. And uh, I'm fascinated by vent. I, I, I find it completely, totally fascinating and I'm coming around to a new way of thinking about how to do it. I, I've been writing some material and doing some thinking and, you know, so who knows? Maybe that'll, that'll emerge shortly as God knows what.
is that specifically kind of like a, an, an American form of puppetry that we've kind of assimilated into being more an American cultural thing or? Well, I think in the heyday, uh, I mean, ventriloquism and throwing your, throwing your voice and all that stuff, you know, dates back to ancient Greece. Right. There were a lot of vents working in England uh, in the 19th century. Uh, with complicated acts with lots of dummies, lots of mechanics, all kinds of crap. Right. Uh, so no, I would I would not really say it's a distinctly American art form. Right. Um, I mean the the vent vent acts in in Britain there were a lot a lot of ventriloquists and a lot of them doing really interesting work. What would you say if somebody who has like a a, a ten year old child who says, "Hey, I love puppetry," what would be that? that first thing you would say, all right, well, try this first. I mean, obviously you can, they can try anything, but what would you be like, what would be the training wheels version of advice you would give? People getting into puppetry. I, I don't, I, I don't have any advice. The thing is about ventriloquism, which has had this big resurgence because America has talent or something. Right. Uh, <laughs> Fader and the young woman whose name I don't know. And, and also the, uh, the English woman with the monkey, uh, the, and and also uh, what's his name, Jeff Dunham. Right. Uh, I mean, Terry Fader got a hundred million dollar deal in Vegas to do ventriloquism. So this caused a lot of people to, you know, wow, ventriloquism. But I don't. I'm not that interested in any any of their acts. Particularly, I don't find them particularly compelling or interesting. Right. Um, uh, I'm interested in the psychological aspects of it. I mean, and that's kind of why I'm I'm still working on it. David David Strassman, who uh, is an American, works a lot in Australia. He he travels that area. He explores that area. But um, I love Senior Wences. I mean, he was he was really my my favorite vent. Right, with Johnny, you know, with the the little hand that talked and the guy in the box and all of that. He yeah. was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had to like the, the the wig and everything on the yeah the hands. Yeah. Yeah. And his, he did the same act for over 70 years. Right. And he was on the Sullivan show all the time. And he lived just down the street from the um, Ed Sullivan Theater. So if somebody bailed at the last minute and canceled. Sullivan would call up Wences and Wences would run over and do his act. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was great. I love that guy. So, so where are you? So what's, um, is there now that things are kind of like, we're kind of getting on the other end of this, is there, uh, are you looking at trying to get your shows back on the road again or? I, you know, I've been, I just turned 70. I've been doing this for 50 years. My interest <laughs> in going on the road is diminished. Yes. <laughs> I'm just and dealing with the presenters and the travel and all the bullshit and the, the carbon footprint and right. yeah. I just have lost a considerable amount of enthusiasm for that. Right. And making the movies, are, it's extremely time-consuming. It's very difficult. It's a new skill. I'm learning all kinds of stuff. I love the miniaturization of it. It's really fun dressing the sets. It's really fun looking at the frame edge to edge and composing it like you're a painter or something. I mean, it's, right. it's all new territory for me so that's really interesting and i want to stick with the vent thing keep working on the vent thing and really find a way to make a revolutionary ventriloquist act right yeah there you <laughs> go <That means. laughs> yeah thank you so much for coming on this has been it's been a genuine pleasure chatting with you it's it's so nice to talk to some pop culture icons that have Vermont roots. It's always so important. So, Well, that's cool. Thanks so much. And yeah, yeah, I'm very grateful to my friends and family in Vermont um, and the fans and supporters and yeah, so many friends, so many wonderful people in the Northeast Kingdom and in central Vermont. And I'm very grateful to Putney School and to Goddard College and the Farmer Wilderness Camps more than more than anyone because everything in my life flowed from Farmer Wilderness Camps. Right. Uh, every job I ever had, every everything came from my Gono's Quaker summer camp down in southern mm -hmm. Vermont. So uh, it's a very special place to me. Um, 
and I, I love it. So I'm very grateful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And it was, it was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah. Likewise, man. <laughs>